Russian troops continue to advance in Ukraine. They're now encroaching on the capital city of Kiev. Credible reports also indicate that Russian soldiers are holding hostage the staff of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Critics say President Biden's sanctions on Russia aren't tough enough, and many warn that Putin's endgame goes far beyond Ukraine. Brody Carter has the story. People in Ukraine's capital of Kyiv woke to gunfire in several areas today as Russian forces pushed deeper into the country. The outskirts of Kyiv felt the brunt of the aggression after unleashing airstrikes on cities and military bases. Intelligence wars of Russian spies and saboteurs near Kyiv. Every day, people have been forced to hide in subway tunnels from missile strikes, now targeting residential buildings. The city of Kyiv is home to more than 2.8 million people. Many have become journalists on the ground, using cell phones to capture the first images of war. Russian troops have entered from the north, east, and south. The president of Ukraine says Kyiv is the main target. Ukraine's president urging citizens to stand and fight. CBN's George Thomas is in the city of Lviv in Ukraine. President Zelensky uh, urged everyone between the ages of 18 and 60 to take up arms. They are no match for, for the Russian army. And, and the reality is that uh, in, uh, in a fairly short order, uh, Ukraine uh, could be in the hands of, uh, of the Kremlin. Russian forces have also taken over many strategic positions including the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We are outraged by credi credible reports that Russian soldiers are currently holding the staff of the Chernobyl facilities hostage. President Biden and U.S. allies responding to Russia's invasion with sanctions. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe cost on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. Critics, including Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, says those sanctions are not enough. Sir, sanctions clearly have not been enough to deter Vladimir Putin to this point. What is going to stop him? No one expected the sanctions to prevent anything from happening. But others argued that the administration had argued the threat of sanctions was designed to stop an invasion. And they say more sanctions are needed now. Putin also raised another threat, that Russia might use nuclear weapons if anyone tried to use military action to stop its takeover of Ukraine. And Putin may have more on his mind than just Ukraine. The president was asked today, what if this goes beyond Ukraine? And he said, if Putin moves into NATO countries, we will be involved. He, he said, we will be involved. Is this a possibility? Is it a possibility that Putin goes beyond Ukraine? Sure, it's a possibility. Like many international analysts, the president says capturing Ukraine is not his ultimate endgame. He has much larger ambitions in Ukraine. He wants to, in fact, reestablish the former Soviet Union. That's what this is about. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, for more analysis on this story, joining us is uh, Victoria Coates. She's a distinguished fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council, and she's a past deputy national security advisor under President Trump. So tell us, what, what are Putin's long-range goals beyond Ukraine? Well, good morning, Gordon. Thank you for having me on. I think, unfortunately, we're watching play out in real time. Uh, Vladimir Putin's stated ambition to reassemble the Soviet Union. And, you know, a year ago, it would have been unthinkable to have tanks rolling into a sovereign nation and, and an ally of the United States like Ukraine, but that's, that's where we are now. And I think the administration has to start taking very, very serious steps to stop this, this contagion from spreading into our other NATO allies in Europe. Well, if, if other NATO allies are invaded, and, and that's... You know, you look at a map and you can see the NATO countries surrounding Ukraine. Uh, what would what would then be triggered under the current treaties with NATO? Well, we do have what what are known as our Article Five obligations, which is that that force is a possible response when a NATO ally is is attacked. And the only time Article Five has been invoked is after the uh, terrorist attacks in the United States on 9-11. So it's very, very rare. Um, but in the case of, of potential incursions into Poland or the Baltics, I think right now the administration has to take the strongest possible steps so Putin knows there is going to be 
very significant ramifications if he takes that action. And so the sanctions that we've seen so far just simply are not strong enough. And I'd, I'd point out that in January, bipartisan support for sanctions on Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline were on the table in the Senate and could have passed. And the administration chose instead to lobby against those sanctions. Uh, so we, we've had these opportunities to send a message to Putin. It's long overdue, and they have to start today. Well, he's already put nuclear weapons on the table. He's already said if there's any response, he is willing to use nuclear weapons. Are, are we looking at World War III? We don't have to be, Gordon. That's the whole tragedy of this situation is it is, it is happening uh, because of the inertia and, uh, I would say, the myopia of the U.S. administration, which seems far more focused on getting a new deal with the Iranian regime in Vienna on the nuclear program and on climate issues than they are on actually stopping World War III from breaking out. I know you have another, uh, another guest on who was a witness to World War II who uses the very powerful words, never again. They have to mean something. We cannot go through this again in Europe. And there are steps we can take to prevent it. We should start immediately, sanction the Russian National Bank, sanction Putin himself, so that he knows the America is not going to stand for this. Well, speaking of sanctions, we haven't sanctioned uh, the oil and natural gas coming out of Russia. And apparently that is now financing the invasion. So why do we still uh, allow them to export oil and gas? It's absolutely mindless. And as an alum of, of the Department of Energy, as well as the National Security Council staff, I know uh, firsthand how powerful the American energy renaissance was under President Trump, which allowed us to become one of the world's great exporters of oil and gas. And it's a tremendous strategic advantage to us. But when President Biden, on day one of his administration, canceled the Keystone Pipeline, he took more than 800,000 barrels a day offline for the, uh, for the continental United States. And now we, we import more than half a billion barrels a day from Russia. So we're literally paying Putin to invade Ukraine. We're financing it. And the best response the administration could come up yet with, with yesterday was uh, former secretary, now Special Envoy Kerry, complaining that maybe this would distract Putin from cooperation on climate change. It, it, it makes no sense. And so I think we need to develop a very powerful domestic energy incentivization program to ex massively expand our production of gas and oil, export that to our friends, consume it domestically, do not pay Putin. Uh, do not reward his aggression and offensive military operations. This is something, again, we could start today if we wanted to. It would have been great if we had started six months ago or if we hadn't turned it off a year ago. But we have this capacity. We have this strength. And uh, we, all we need to do is, is have the will to grab it. So very much hope the administration will start to start to see this clear picture. Well, let's change theaters and talk about China. Taiwan just warned yesterday that more Chinese planes have, are entering their d defense zones. It seems like uh, every single week we have a new sortie of Chinese planes entering into Taiwan airspace. Are they going to uh, take advantage of this? Is, is Taiwan now at risk? I think they absolutely are. And this, that's, again, why this is such a dangerous situation, is these, these things are related. Uh, there are always those in Washington who want to sort of stovepipe one problem from the other and say, well, we're going to pivot to Asia so we can't pay attention to Ukraine and we're going to pull out of the Middle East. Unfortunately, President Xi of China is watching all of these things. And he has, as Putin did with Ukraine, Xi has with Taiwan made very, very clear his intentions to uh, regain control of the island. Uh, I've been speaking with a number of, of former uh, Taiwanese colleagues in recent days. They are deeply, deeply concerned by what's happening in Ukraine. They made public statements yesterday uh, in support of the, the legitimate government of Ukraine. And I think, again, as the United States, we have to be extremely firm on this. We have to make our red lines clear on Taiwan. And for us, I mean, this is not simply a case of supporting another democracy, something I'm in favor of. But Taiwan is such a critical partner in terms of the semiconductor industry and other 
uh, high-tech products we desperately need in this country, you know, this is simply a case of, of self-interest, that we, we cannot afford to lose Taiwan. And so getting, getting the administration very clearly focused on that, e even given these other crises that are, are burgeoning up around the glo globe, I think is critical. Could you spell it out for us? I, I, I'm not sure the average American understands the impact here. So we've seen wheat prices go through the roof because Ukraine is one of the world's largest suppliers of red wheat. Uh, we've seen oil and gas go up because of the conflict. What would happen if China invades Taiwan? How would that impact the average American? Well, I, I would take it right back to the semiconductor uh, industry, the, the, the semiconductors that power so many things in our lives from cars, you know, computers, whatever uh, products that we, we need and want. Uh, Taiwan very strategically developed a tremendous capacity in that industry and are one, or, one of our key partners because we've, we've sort of fallen off in our own domestic production something we should also get after. But for the moment, Taiwan, a good friend and ally, can be our supplier. Uh, but you, if, if any, all, all of your, your viewers have had issues, as I think we all have, with the supply chain over the last year and the snarls in that and the difficulties of, of getting anything from a couch to a car, that will be exponentially higher. Uh, and so, you know, you will have compounded the inflationary pressures from the Ukraine uh, the Ukraine invasion with potentially a disruption in, in goods and supplies into the United States because of Taiwan, we could be looking at a very difficult period. Well, Victoria, thank you for the analysis. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, if you're... Wish I had better news. Thanks, Gordon. All right. Thank you. If, if you're interested in helping people in Ukraine, uh, Operation Blessing, CBN, we've been working there for now over three decades. Uh, we have disaster relief teams forming on the border of Poland, but we're also right there in the uh, really hard hit areas, uh, the eastern part of Russia. And we, I thought we had some B-roll of the, just how bad it is, and, and there's some of the destruction that's happening. Uh, but we also have photos of you in action, where Operation Blessing teams are now working in eastern Ukraine and in, in the very heart of this, and they're delivering food. We have a, um, a, a kitchen operating that has been operating, but we're also b bringing bags of food to people in need. If you want to participate, it's real easy. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to be a part of Operation Blessing Disaster Relief. 98 years young and still working. Walter Bingham is the oldest journalist in the world. He also holds the title of the oldest radio talk show host. Walter moved to Israel in 2004, where he still lives today. And recently, Chris Mitchell sat down with a Holocaust survivor to find out what keeps him going strong. Israel National Radio's senior broadcaster, Walter Bingham. Hello and welcome. At 98, Walter Bingham is a marvel. From Holocaust survivor to World War II hero to a journalist for 50 years, Bingham has experienced a lot. So first of all, I think people would want to know you're 98 years old. How did you do it? Well, if I want to be facetious, I'm just saying, look, sit down, hold on to your chair. I don't eat garlic. I run a mile from garlic. <laughs> but the actual fact is that I am blessed with good genes from the good Lord. Guinness World Records has deemed Walter both the oldest radio talk show host living and the oldest journalist, an honor also recognized by Israel's government press office. You are the oldest active news correspondent in the world. Life, however, hasn't always been about honors for Bingham. In his Jerusalem apartment, he keeps reminders of the dark days of his youth. Born in 1924, Bingham was 15 years old when Adolf Hitler started what became known as the Holocaust. On his bookshelf, he keeps a copy of the Nazi leader's infamous autobiography, Mein Kampf, written in the year of Bingham's birth. In it, Hitler details his final solution to exterminate the Jews. This copy came from a Nazi office after the war. Your life has spanned so many events in history. One of them is the Holocaust. 
But what happened to you in the early 1930s? You were witness to the infamous book burnings. Yes, we used to go to the park as boys and play there. And one day they had uh, the book burning and uh, we saw it and uh, people were throwing books on the fire, German culture onto the fire. And you were also there at Kristallnacht. Yeah, Kristallnacht was in 1938. One day I saw that things went, a bit of a commotion in the streets. And then I got nearer and uh, I actually saw that synagogue in a town called Mannheim burning. And the fire service was there, but not to douse the flames of the synagogue, but to cool down neighboring property, German property that it shouldn't burn. Kristallnacht marked the beginning of Hitler's final solution, and those who lived through it are Holocaust survivors. Within months, Bingham's mother put him on the so-called Kinder Transport, a rescue effort by the British to evacuate some 10,000 Jewish children by train to Great Britain. It was five minutes before war. Everybody knew the war would break out, and the parents took the children to the train. Five years later, Bingham joined the British Army. It wasn't my country, but my motivation and that of other refuge, Jewish refugee soldiers was much greater because we didn't fight for we fought against the Nazis. My motivation was find the family, get rid of the Nazi regime. Two days after D-Day, Bingham landed on the beaches of Normandy and then drove an ambulance on the battlefields of Europe, eventually receiving a medal for bravery and commendation from the king. I never killed anybody. I only saved lives. As the war ended, Bingham was transferred to counterintelligence in Hamburg, Germany. There he interviewed Nazis arrested by the British, among them Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister. And they brought him into my office and I said, Herr Ribbentrop, what can you tell me about the final solution? And he looked me in the face and he said, I didn't know anything about that. That was the Führer. And I said, so now I take it that you heard about that. How did you find out? And he turned to me and he said, I read it in the newspaper. After the war, Bingham was one of the few kinder transport children reunited with at least one parent, his mother. My mother went through the camps and came out alive and I was reunited with her. That was, of course, the most emotional moment of my life. The second most emotional moment in my life was when I came here with my plane I was on my way to Elat, and I asked the controller if it's okay to do some orbits above Jerusalem. And there I was, above the city, seeing everything. All my life as a religious Jew, in every prayer, Jerusalem. And here I was, sitting over Jerusalem, crying like a baby, tears streaming down my cheeks, uh, and having to fly this plane. Bingham says the best thing he ever did in his life was to get married and have a family. And the second best was to move to Israel. In 2004, at the height of the Second Intifada, 80-year-old Bingham immigrated to Israel and continued working as a journalist. Before COVID, Bingham would share his experiences with groups of students and others. He would bring a small suitcase packed with remnants of that Nazi era. This is the sign of the Hitler Youth. Now that is, is there that you can really stick it in. Mm -hmm. And this is blood and error, blood and honor. And that's what the 14-year-olds and 13-year-olds carried. So are you concerned that what's happening in the world today is what was happening? Oh, no, I have no doubt. We are living in equal period of the 1930s, except there will be no final solution because we have the state of Israel. But everything leading up to it and all the atrocities and all the attacks and all the things that you read about, all that is a copy of the 1930s. And our local friends here are copying what the Nazis did. What's the lesson that people need to take away? Never again. Just two words. Never again. Unfortunately, people don't learn. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Yes, let's echo that, never again, and let us do whatever we can to stomp, stamp out anti-Semitism. And it, we're seeing it arise 
in Europe. We're seeing it right here in the United States of America. But the greatest danger right now, in my opinion, to the Jewish state is the nation of Iran. And we keep wanting to take sanctions off. We keep wanting to somehow negotiate with them. Uh, their ideology, let's get it very plain, we are the great Satan. The little Satan is Israel. They are dedicated to wiping Israel off the map. And then when they're finished with that, they're going to come after us. If they get a nuclear weapon, it's one of the greatest dangers the world faces today. Never again, let us resolve, never again. It will never happen again, but it seems to be happening all around us. An overnight rock star. That's how Ryan described himself after he began selling drugs in college. Drunk with power, Ryan was soon on his way to building a drug empire. At 23 years old, he had everything he ever wanted. So why was he relieved when he got busted? Take a look. Ryan Prasad knew well the spoils of a big time drug dealer. He also knew the stakes. The reality is you go to jail or you die, like, and that's exactly how it goes for the dope game. Ryan grew up in Delta, British Columbia, the oldest of three kids. His dad was a violent alcoholic who focused his rage on Ryan's mom and ignored his kids. As much as Ryan wanted to help, there was little he could do. I felt like I should have been able to do more, but I really couldn't. It just felt like I was a failure as a man. I had like a lot of resentment towards my dad. By the time he started high school, Ryan was insecure, angry, and looking for escape. Alcohol and marijuana would cure all those, not to mention earning him the acceptance he craved. I just felt like I have all this like baggage inside of me, and then every time I had a drink or smoked pot, like it was like a temporary relief away from everything. Marijuana wasn't legal, so you were considered cool or a rebel. It seemed like I attracted a different crowd. After starting college in 2010, Ryan began selling weed for a little extra cash and to support his habit. It quickly became more than that. Now, he was somebody. I just felt power and it just like, just consumed me. Everything that I was learning in school, I was actually applying to my business. Just like a pretty quiet kid and it just like it didn't have that kind of popularity, but I just became like an overnight rock star. For Ryan, the money and partying was just too good. So in his junior year, he dropped out to sell harder drugs full time with the goal of creating his own empire. It became really self-centered, really selfish, and I really wanted my independence. You know, I wanted my own place. I wanted to like drive a better car. I want to have the girlfriend. You know, I want it now and I want it the fastest way possible. After living two years as a rock star drug dealer, Ryan had everything he wanted and more. Money, respect, and a several hundred dollar a day drug habit. At 23 years old, he saw no way out. It was just an endless cycle, and all those same issues were still there. I just felt so inadequate and felt like such a failure. I hated myself. It was just really hard for me to even look at myself. I hated what I became. I didn't knew what I was doing wrong, and I knew I needed to get out. And the reality was I'm probably going to have to stay here until I go to jail or I die. So for the next three months, Ryan did the only thing he could think of. He prayed. I believed in some sense of a higher power in God. I was like really asking God if you're there, like I need you to help me out of my lifestyle and what I'm doing because I don't know how I'm going to get out or what to do. I was desperate. Then in October of 2016, Ryan was arrested when he sold narcotics to an undercover police officer. When authorities searched his home, they also found a gun. Now in jail, Ryan faced six years in prison. I was just like kind of relieved. Like I wasn't even anxious or really stressed out. I was hoping it would be the answer to my prayer at the time. Just like, okay, like finally, like this is the start of a new beginning. That made me realize that God was like actually working in this. Three weeks later, the court granted Ryan's request to be released on bail to a Christian recovery house called Luke 15. There, he began attending a local church and a prayer group. One night as the leader prayed over Ryan. I just felt like this presence just like came over me, around me. Complete bliss is the best way to describe it. It was just joy, peace. And I've done a lot of drugs in my life and like nothing could compare to that. After learning more about faith in God in the coming months, Ryan surrendered his life to Christ and was baptized. Everything changed for me. Like, you know, all these fears and insecurities and problems and issues, everything just didn't matter anymore. Like a new experience and felt God in my life for the first time ever. I remember like 
going to sleep with a smile on my face, waking up with a smile on my face, skipping up the stairs, hugging people. Later found guilty of drug possession, trafficking, and possession of an illegal firearm, Ryan would serve six months of a 23-month sentence before being released on parole in 2018. Today, he's working full-time for a roofing company. He also speaks out to teens about the dangers of drugs and the fulfillment he's found in Christ. He's changed me. He still has a lot to teach me. Where I didn't feel like I was good enough, he did give me purpose. I enjoy my life, you know, I live a happy life, and it's all it comes down to your heart. If he could do this for me, like, imagine what he could do for you. If he could do it for me, imagine what he could do for you. Here's Ryan. He's had a dramatic encounter with a living God. We can call it various names. You can call it born again. You can call it regenerated. You can call it a baptism in love. You can call it the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. You can call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But these names don't even begin to describe the experience you can have with God, where you understand, you finally understand how much he loves you, how much he wants you to be with him for all eternity, how he died for you, how he wants to forgive you, how he wants to give you. It's a gift, give you righteousness, peace, and joy. Here's Ryan. He's been arrested. He gets released into this um, you know, rehab, th Christian rehab center, and, and he gets prayed over, and something happens to him. And now he says, I wake up with a smile on my face. I go to bed with a smile on my face. I have these things. Here's the great news. You can have it, and you can have it right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get cleaned up first. You don't have to have something dramatic happen in your life to finally come to the realization you can have an experience with God. Here's the promise, and this promise from Jesus. I will manifest myself. You don't have to have faith in a book. You don't have to have faith in what other people tell you. You don't have to have faith in miracles that happened a long time ago. You can have your faith rest on the power of God in your experience with him right now. How do you get it? Well, you do the same thing Ryan did. You ask for it. You pray. Now, let's pray together. And Jesus will show up for you. He wants to. He says very clearly, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door, I'll come in. So, let's do that. He's standing. He's knocking. All we have to do is open the door, and he'll come in to you. And he'll do it right now. Let's pray. Let's believe the Word of God, and He'll do it for you. Pray with me. Jesus, say His name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you. Lord, you know the things that I've done wrong. I turn from them now, and I turn to you, and I ask that you forgive me. I want to be free of all of it. Take away all my compulsions. Take away all my sin. And give me the righteousness, peace, and joy that exists in you. I need that now. So Jesus, come into my heart. Make me new. For I ask it in your name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing with joy, with peace, and with your righteousness. Let them know that their prayer has been heard and has been answered today. 
We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What I want you to do right now is pick up the phone and call us and let us know. Just prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Numbers on the screen, 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call, I've got something for you. It's called A New Day. And in this is a packet that's got a CD teaching of what a Christian's believe. If you don't have a CD player, you can get it as a download. All you have to do is go to cbn.com slash a new day. But in here is a booklet um, filled with Bible verses. How do you know your sins are forgiven? What do you do now as a Christian? It's all there. It's all free. No financial obligation at all. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Biden administration will significantly loosen federal mask wearing guidelines to protect against COVID-19 transmission today. That means most Americans will no longer be advised to wear masks in indoor public settings. Masks have been recommended for people residing in communities with substantial or high transmission under current guidelines. That's roughly 95 percent of U.S. counties. Under the new guidelines, the vast majority of Americans will no longer live in areas where indoor masking in public is recommended. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping children around the world. Seven-year-old Charity lives in a remote area of Kenya where clean water is difficult to find and she would not have gotten the proper nutrition or a good education. But thanks to support from its partners, Operation Blessing provided a free school in her area. Through the school, Charity and other young children can get clean water so that they can live with their families as well. And they get two nutritious meals a day while at school. The students also study with electronic tablets to help their education. And the school has toys, swing sets, and slides for the children to play. Charity drew a special thank you, as you see there, to show that she really appreciates Operation Blessing supporters saying thank you for a warm meal and clean drinking water. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Abishak had a bad reputation in his neighborhood and, and his school, and he was a bully. Quick to pick a fight, disrespectful to his parents, yet all that changed after a teacher introduced him to Superbook. Abishak fought constantly, threw tantrums, and got kicked out of school for bad behavior. Many neighbors and parents complain about him to me. I scolded him and so did his father, but his attitude did not change. Abhishek's parents convinced him to go to an after-school program run by Orphan's Promise. He learned arts and crafts, did group activities, and watched Superbook. I used the Superbook stories to explain to Abhishek how his bad behavior could separate him from God. He gradually started taking interest in all the good lessons of the Superbook series. I realized we should have faith in God and we should also ask for forgiveness for our sins through prayer. Abhishek prayed with his teacher and she asked God to protect him and bring out the good in him. After this, he stopped getting into trouble in school and started focusing on his studies. He was an obedient child at home too. Abhishek's life was being transformed. He even bought himself a Bible and studied it intently. Abhishek told us about the Bible stories and showed us the Superbook episodes at home. He always prayed for the healing when I fell sick and his prayers were always answered. I explained to my parents about the miracles of Jesus Christ from Superbook and the Bible. Jesus gave sight to the blind, healed the crippled and raised people from death. Gradually, my parents started believing in Jesus Christ. Seeing this great change in Abhishek, even I was influenced by the love of God. Me and my family have now accepted Jesus Christ. Parents in his community no longer see Abhishek as a mischief maker. Instead, they see him as a positive influence on their children. I love telling people about Jesus. I am forever grateful to CBN and Superbook for giving me a new life, a life filled with purpose and peace. That gratitude goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. We're a lot more than just a TV show. 
We want to reach the world with the gospel. We want to reach the children of the world with the stories of the Bible. You're a part of all of that when you join the 700 Club. Now, how much is it? It's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, I've got a gift for you. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God. In it, he distills down 60 years of ministry at CBN, how he got direction from God on all the decisions he made uh, all along the way through 60 years and how you can get direction from God for your life. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join the 700 Club. So call us now, 1-800-700-7000. And if you'd like to help CBN Animation, we're expanding out this year. We're going beyond just Superbook. We also have these wonderful episodes of Gizmos Go. So if you want to support our CBN Animation, for a gift of $25, a recurring monthly gift of $25, we'll send you the latest copy. It's called Gizmo's Roadmap to Easter. Along with that, you'll get a bonus DVD, a double feature with two episodes of The Last Supper and He is Risen. So you get five DVDs from CBN Animation, online access to over 65 episodes of Superbook that you and your whole family can enjoy. So if you want to support our CBN Animation, call us, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. Again, it's a recurring gift of $25 a month. You help us produce new episodes of Superbook, Gizmo Go, other animation specials. You help us with the translation, the distribution costs. You're, you're a part of all of it so the children of the world can understand the stories of the Bible. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? More than three in five Americans confess to being chronically lonely, and the ongoing pandemic has only exacerbated their isolation. So if you're one of the lonely, how do you find your people? Take a look. A New York Times bestselling author and founder of the women's ministry, If Gathering, Ginny Allen believes there are solutions to the loneliness we all feel. You're gonna find friendships in places that you didn't expect. But they're all sinners, and so are you. And so this is gonna be messy. Through her latest book, Find Your People, Jenny explains why a deep sense of community is so vital and how we can build it. Jenny Allen, welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks for having me, Terry. Why do you think so many of us are so lonely? Oh. I think there's a lot of reasons. I think we are up against a cultural shift that is truly unprecedented in the last few generations. You look back to throughout history, to Adam and Eve till the Industrial Revolution, people have lived in small villages. They've lived tucked away with 50 to 150 people that they know all their lives, that they raise their kids together, and they take care of each other from birth to death. And so we are, you know, in a new, a new wave of doing community that, that it isn't working. We are so lonely and isolated. And 80% of the world today still lives in those village type communities. And even in the midst of poverty, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday that grew up in the slums of India. And he said, Jenny, he said, I was poor, but I was never lonely. And I think in our culture right now, we are so afraid to need each other. We're so afraid to ask for help. We're so afraid that nobody will be there if we do ask for help, that, that I think we've gotten isolated and protected ourselves from each other. Well, and sometimes really forming real friendships, pain and shame come into the, the whole mix. How does that contribute to loneliness? Does that keep us from yeah. deeper relationships? Yeah, it is very complicated because not only do we have a cultural issue, but we also have a personal issue, right? People have hurt us. All of us have stories where we have risked asking for help or we have risked being known and, and letting somebody in and it hasn't gone well. I remember being a pastor's wife and, and sharing something with a friend, trying to get comfort and help and, and they used it against us. And it was just so hurtful and it made me close off and it made me self-protect. But 
this isn't living. We need each other and, and to live connected. In fact, it's one of the greatest cravings we have from the time we are born. Kurt Thompson, who's a, a psychiatrist, he says, we come into the world looking for someone looking for us and that we never quit looking for someone looking for us. And I just think that's such a beautiful way to express what we're all feeling right now. And I know, I know so many people, people watching feel that way. So, Jenny, what are a few of the ways that we can connect with others and build a sense of healthy community? Well, what I researched in the book was how could we get back to that village existence that has existed for all time? How could we build that wherever we are? And I heard the most amazing stories of people, one man in a nursing home that put a sign outside of his door and said, um, the house of forgiveness. And people would come in and the nurses helped him to take care of people and to bring them in and he would share the love of Jesus with them. I think wherever we are and whoever God has put around us, that can be our village. That we don't need to just look for our two or three best friends, but we need to see the person walking outside with their dog and go meet them. And we need to notice the barista at our favorite coffee shop and know them by name and have conversations with them. So what I encourage people to do is just notice who's around you first. Start knowing their names. Start, start talking to them longer than one second find out what they need and how they're doing. And then also don't be afraid to, to need something from them. I always say, borrow the ladder from your neighbor before you go buy one at Home Depot, because we really don't use a ladder very often. So whatever you need, try to see if you can borrow it from someone because people love to feel needed. So don't be afraid. If I know we're all worried about being needy, but honestly, it is the beginning of relationship and friendship. And you see that around the world right now. So talk a little bit about that, that opening comment that that, that opening up with people can get messy. What does that mean? Well, I think everyone that has ever been vulnerable with someone knows it is awkward. It is not easy. Starting even a new friendship with someone saying, hey, would you be my friend? I know that sounds so dorky and awkward. All of it is. Like everything about friendship is awkward. But we're all coming out of quarantine. You heard the stat. Three and five are lonely and post quarantine and all the things that we're going to come into this post-COVID world with, everybody's lonely. So the good news is anyone that you pursue, anyone that you want to start a friendship with, they probably need that friendship too. And so we just have to practice it. It is messy. And there might be rejection and you might feel like, gosh, nobody's interested. The reality is people have forgotten how to have great conversations. People have forgotten how to need each other and how to, um, to be in deep relationships together. And so we're going to have to all awkwardly and messily learn how to do this again. So you recommend that an inner circle of three to five people is what we should be looking for. But, you know, not everybody's going to be your, your inner circle best friend. So what quality should we be looking for? Well, the three things I say that make for that inner circle to be the most healthy is number one, humility, that they can work through conflict. You will get to conflict and you need a humble person that can work through it. Number two, availability. They need to have some time margin to be your friend. It takes 200 hours for someone to become go from a, an acquaintance to an inner circle, very best friend. So, so you need somebody with availability. And then the last thing is vulnerability, that they'll open up. If you're gonna open up, you want them to open up in return. What if they don't? <laughs> a lot of people won't. But you also have to remember that everybody is craving this. And so I always say don't give up on people too quickly. Keep asking them questions. Keep sharing your heart with them and see. They might, but they might have been so wounded in the past that they've forgotten that this is worth it. And so I just say fight for people. Fight for people. Don't give up on them. And when it gets hard and when it gets messy, keep fighting for them. Well, Jenny's book is called Find Your People, Building Deep Community in a Lonely World. It is available wherever books are sold. Jenny Allen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Terry. Well, we've got a few minutes, Gordon, for okay. an email or two. This am, I, is, am I in the three, three to five? You're in the three to five. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we've had more than 200, 200 hours. I don't know. This is, <laughs> yes, we've survived each other. <laughs> Well, I count it all joy. <laughs> and so do I. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, let's get to email here. Okay. This is Vernelia who says, the Bible says, quote, owe no one anything but love. Can you explain what that means? Well, the Bible's very, very specific. Don't be in debt. Uh, don't be in financial debt. Don't be under obligation to people. And so the Apostle Paul is writing that, and he's saying that our commandment is to love one another. So if you start viewing that as an obligation, that 
uh, don't owe anyone but 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 love. If if you if you say, well, I owe you my love, then you've sort of changed the equation where love is no longer based on what you're feeling or the outpouring of your heart, but you you really start to understand. I have to treat everyone around me with love. Some days that's really hard. I know for me, it's sometimes it's really hard to say, okay, I've, I've got to love someone through all of this. But when you have it as this is my obligation, my service, uh, not just to myself but, and not just to the person, but to God, that I, I owe it to God to love one another, uh, then you get it in the right perspective. And that's what the apostle meant. This is Adrian who says, how do I know God heard my prayer since I haven't received a miracle? Well, there's, there's two things here. One, uh, the Apostle John is quite specific that if we pray in accordance with his will, then we know that he hears us. So here's a good way to understand God's will. Look to heaven. What's happening in heaven? So in heaven, is there anybody sick? Is there anybody poor? Is there anybody lonely? Uh, is there anybody that is depressed? Is anybody grieving? So you look at that and you can get a real clear picture of God's will. So start praying in accordance with his will and you know that he'll hear you. Then look to the proverb that, Je that, that Jesus, not the proverb, the parable that Jesus taught about the importune widow and the unrighteous judge. And so here's the widow going, know that, knowing the judge has the ability the power to grant her request. She knocks on his door in the middle of the night until he gets up. She doesn't give up until she gets the answer. You combine those two things, you'll get answers to prayer. Here's a word from Proverbs. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. May we all have friends just like Terry who will stick close. And just like Gordon. <laughs>